Thank you so much, Heather, and thank you, Julianne, for for leading us in in worship this morning. It uh, it was a blessing, uh, a huge blessing, and um, yeah, um, I'm just so grateful to be a part of a church that supports one another and uh, and cares for one another. And um, yeah, uh, it's fantastic. It's really really good. Someone this morning needs to hear this verse. And as I was praying with someone um, through uh, this week, uh, God inspired me to share this verse. And it says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When Paul wrote this, he was in prison. But yet he could say, honestly, earnestly, rejoice in the Lord always. And then just so we didn't miss it, he says, I will say it again, rejoice. Why? Because the Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is not cold. He is not distant. He is personal. He is loving. And he is there. More than that, he says that we don't need to be anxious. But through prayer, through petition, through thanksgiving, we can present our request to God and receive a peace that passes all understanding, that transcends all understanding. A peace that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And that's what I pray. That's what I pray for you. I have a van. And the reason I purchased this van is because during the whole lockdowns of last year, my heart longed for freedom. And I thought to myself, this is a, a good project uh, that I can do. And so over the a couple of months ago, my wife and I started by stripping it out, putting insulation in it. Uh, putting carpet on the walls and plyboard, et cetera, to make it warmer. And then I drove 2,000 kilometers to Queensland, spent a week with my dad, fitting it out and, and uh, you know, making it more into a camper van, starting with putting a bed and storage underneath, working out the wiring so that it can charge while it's driving. The batteries that we've got in the back can charge while we're driving so that I can run a small fridge, I can run an electric blanket, and we just put a, a small kitchen. It's not finished, it's, and it's nothing pretty, friends. But I want to say I love it. I love it because it works. On my way back, uh, I camped at Dubbo, and it was negative three. And you can see the heavy frost on the windscreen. But I was toasty warm in that van, uh, enjoying my uh, electric blanket, and uh, you know, just enjoying some freedom uh, while while I was camping as well. But there's one thing I don't like about this van. One thing actually I don't like at all, and that's because it has a deceptive uh, fuel gauge. Because as I was driving the 4,000 kilometers uh, to Queensland and back again, I ran out of fuel twice. And you might be thinking, Pastor Paul, how can you run out of fuel not just once but twice? Surely you're not so bright. And I want to say honestly, yeah, I'm not the brightest man in the world, but I've I've got an excuse. <laughs> Let me tell you how it happened. So as we were driving from uh, Kilcoy, where Marcel's parents live, to, um, to Rockhampton, where my, my mother lives, it's 620 kilometers. And I was keeping an eye on the fuel gauge as I was going. And when we got about just over, actually, half full, it said 300 kilometers. We had traveled 300 kilometers. And I said, I can make this. I can go all the way to Rockhampton in one tank. And as we were driving, getting closer and closer, it was on a quarter and I only had 100 kilometers to go. And I said, I can make this. But pretty soon, that deceptive fuel gauge dropped rapidly during that last 100 kilometers. And then as I was just going down a straight, I realized that the van had lost power and I had run out of fuel. And so, what was I going to do? I gave a quick call to mum. Mum was, because I was only 20 kilometers from Rockhampton. I thought she could come, she'd bring a Jerry, help me out, but she was busy with other things. And so what was I going to do? I prayed about it. 
And then I looked and just 200 meters down the road were some workmen working on a bridge, um, fixing up a railway bridge. So I walked up to them, told my daughter who I was traveling with, don't talk to strangers, and uh, walked up the road and asked them, do you have any diesel? And they said, yes, we've got a 20 liter uh, jerry can. I gave them 30 bucks cash and I walked back down the road, filled up the van, took a while to get it started, but I got it started, dropped off the jerry can and, and drove into Rockhampton, praising the Lord. But it was at 600 kilometers that it ran out of fuel. And so I thought to myself, ah, I will never go anywhere close to 600 again. I know I've done it 550. I will have no problems in the future. I'm never going to go anywhere close to 550 kilometers. Then on the way back, just as I was passing past Dubbo, back to home, uh, I was on the way between two towns. And it was 100 kilometers between these two towns. And I, so I checked how many kilometers I've done. 435. I said, yes, I can make it. But as I was getting closer again, that deceptive fuel gauge was going wound down way too fast. And then 15 kilometers before I reached the next town at uh, 520 kilometers, I had run out of fuel again, lost power, I pulled over to the shoulder. I didn't have anybody with me in the car. What am I going to do? I'm in the middle of nowhere. And so I started flagging down cars, asked the first guy, do you have any diesel? He said, no, sorry, I can't help you. Uh, another camper van with uh, two elderly ladies came past and said, how can we help? I said, I've run out of fuel. And they said, we'll just take you down 15 kilometers to the next town. You can buy a jerry can and you can hitch your way back. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, very thankful to the ladies who helped me. And then on the way back, it took a couple of tries, but there was a mechanic driving to a farm where he worked. And, uh, and we had a bit of a conversation as we were going, talking about what was happening in the world today, but especially what, how thankful I was uh, for his help. And he says, yeah, it's terrible to be stranded, but there's something about running out of fuel. And I've lost, I've run out of fuel probably five times, maybe six in my lifetime, but it creates something in you. I don't know if you feel this or if it's just me, but there's an uncertainty. Am I going to make it? And normally, well, in these two cases, I pushed it to the absolute limit and I didn't make it. And with that uncertainty of, am I going to make it? It brings fear, it brings worry, and it brings anxiety. But the opposite of this uncertainty is certainty. And I've noticed that when I fill up the car, especially after I've, I've really pushed it, and getting on that definite E-line, uh, I find that it brings this tremendous peace, uh, confidence and rest, certainty that it's gonna be okay, I can go at least another 500 kilometers when I filled it up again. But this is a simple illustration, friends, but it's powerful. And I don't, again, I don't know how you feel in regards to this when you fill up your fuel tank. Maybe you don't even get close to that E, maybe you fill it up when it's half full or whatever. That's wise, I encourage you to do that. But I am thinking, especially recently, to always live as if the tank is full, even if it's not. To always have the certainty, the peace, the, the trust, the rest that comes from God, first and foremost. To live as if the tank is full. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks about the people of faith about being people of faith. And now more than ever, this is, this is what we need. We need to be people of faith because we are living in a time of, of great uncertainty. Uh, what's gonna happen in the future? Uh, what's gonna happen in regards to our government, our freedoms, all these different things. We're living in a time of uncertainty. And more than that, it feels like we're living in a pressure cooker because we don't just have our, our usual uh, concerns and, and problems, uh, maybe it's finances or health or family issues or relationships or whatever it is. But now we've got additional pressures with the coronavirus, with lockdown, with all these extra things that it just feels like we're um, in that pressure cooker, that we're feeling pressure from all sides. 
I was speaking again to somebody this week and you know, different countries are dealing with fires and others with floods and they're dealing with the coronavirus just as well, just exploding in their populations as well. And as we're going through this, you know, this is our sixth lockdown now. And, um, you know, we're almost experts at dealing with, with isolation and stuff like that. But the bigger thing is, and we can handle it. I've seen us handle it. But the bigger thing is how long, you know, how long is this going to go on for? When, when, can, when can we do the things again that we want to do? Hey, perhaps have a holiday, see family. Um, yeah, uh, it just broke my heart to hear again of, of people in our congregation who had made holidays, et cetera. But then because of, of what's happening in different states, they again couldn't participate in that. I want to encourage you. In fact, let's see what the word of God says in regards to how we can be certain in times of uncertainty. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. And this, friends, if you have not read Hebrews 11 for a long time, I want to encourage you. Spend time this Sabbath, spend time this week uh, feasting upon God's word and finding hope and encouragement in God's word. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses one and two. Notice what Paul writes. He says, now faith is being certain of what we hope for. Sorry, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So here, Paul starts off with faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And these is, this is what our forefathers, this is what, uh, as it says, the ancients were commended for, their faith. Faith is not this. Faith is not positive thinking. Faith is not hoping for the best. Faith is not uh, a feeling of, of optimism. It's more than that. It's deeper than that. Someone once said a definition of faith is it, it includes two parts. One, there's the intellectual assent or agreement. And two, there's the actual trust factor in faith. For faith to truly be faith, it needs those two parts. Think of a chair. You can look at that chair and you can see it and you can say that's a solid chair. Uh, that chair is designed to keep me uh, in a sitting position comfortably. But then the second part for that uh, intellectual ascent to actually become faith, there needs to be the trust aspect. And so we actually need to sit in that chair. We actually need to sit in that chair. So faith has those two parts that are essential in our journey, in our growth. And as it says in Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So as it says, uh, the intellectual assent or, or believing that God exists, but much more than that, that trust that he is one that rewards those who earnestly seek him. And unless we have this faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. Martin Luther says, faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. Then it accepts the impossible, does without the indispensable, and bears the intolerable. I like that. I like that. So let's have a look at, our, at Abraham today and his faith, and especially what the Bible commended Abraham's faith for. In Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 10, the Bible says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So Abraham was commended for his faith. Because when God told him to go, he obeyed and went. Let's have a look at that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 12. We're going to be looking at uh, a couple of passages in Genesis uh, regarding Abraham. So why don't you open your Bible, have a look at it together. Maybe you've got a different version. Maybe it says something that will stick out to you as, as I'm reading and maybe as you're reading as well. So don't be shy. Open up your Bibles. Let's have a look at Genesis chapter 12. And it says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed. Through you. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham, Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. I, I love this, friends. And I, again, I want, to, I want to encourage you put yourself in this picture. How would you have responded? Here, Abraham, I keep on saying Abraham, but he wasn't renamed Abraham at this time, he was just Abram. And God saw him in this uh, foreign country, and he saw 75 years old. His father, Terah, had just passed away. And then he, hear, he heard a call from God saying, go. Go into a foreign land, a place that I will show you. And he gave him some beautiful promises of how Abram would be a great nation a nation uh, which God would bless, and more than that, that would be a blessing to others. And as it says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And we know that this is a messianic prophecy, talking about that through uh, Jesus Christ, through the line, the seed of Abraham, uh, came Jesus Christ. And through him, the whole world can find salvation in Christ. But as it says in verse 4, he left. And there's a few things, a lot we can get from this, but two things very, very clearly, very quickly I want to get. Here it uses the word Yahweh. Notice that, that second word in my Bible, the Lord. And the Lord is in, in capital letters. This is talking about the tetragrammaton, the, the holy divine name of God or, or Yahweh. Previously, um, it was translated as Jehovah, uh, but now it's, it's more regularly or more well-known as Yahweh. And it's from the root word to be, or more accurately, it's a, a causative verb. So it, the, the name, his name actually means he causes to become. And as it says uh, in Exodus 3, um, when, when Moses said, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So this is the, the holy divine name of God. Calling Abram to a foreign land. Seeking, seeing something in Abram. That he has faith. To listen, to obey and go at the calling of God. But you see, definitely, you definitely don't see perfection in Abraham's life. You see a growth pattern. And now notice in, in uh, chapter 15, you're seeing a bit of this now. Uh, this is probably eight, 10 years later. The Bible isn't specific about when this is. Um, but in Genesis chapter 15, there's another vision conversation between Abram and God. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. I love this promise. I am your shield, your very 
great reward. One who protects, one who cares. And I like how it says that God is the reward, not the land that, that, that they're going to, but their connection with God. I love that picture. But notice Abram's response. But Abram said, oh, sovereign Lord. We'll talk a bit in a minute, you know, what uh, word that is. Oh, sovereign Lord. What can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. So you see, the, uh, even though God had, had um, taken him out and blessed him and kept him safe on his journey, he, he was frustrated that he had no children then. Uh, Sarai at this time was barren and, um, you know, they couldn't have a child. So he was frustrated. You've given me no children. Now this servant of mine, he's going to be my heir. Verse four, then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He will, he took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and the stars uh, and count the stars if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So here you see a different name and see the exchange between Abraham and God. And here it uses that name Adonai. And Adonai means it's a title of God, Lord or Master. And here you see that God confirms the promise to Abraham, to Abram, that he would receive a son and the son would be, um, how can I say, the son would be from his own body. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a, a, a servant, etc. It would be a son from his own body. And so Abraham, again, had confirmation of the promise that God originally gave him eight, ten years previously. And then verse 17 gives that closure. When Abram was 99 years old, originally called at 75, uh, 24 years later, God speaks to him again. And this time God says to him, he starts off by saying this, I am God almighty. Here we've got a different name, another name for God. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will be greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. So here, the word for um, God Almighty is El Shaddai, the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one, the, the uh, as it says, God Almighty. A reminder to Abraham that even though he's been uh, listening and God had promised him 24 years earlier, now he is showing this is what I can do. Uh, and then within a, a year, a son uh, through Baron Sarah, uh, was born, and Abraham at 100 years old became a father. And here you see the response um, in verse 3. As soon as he heard God's voice and, and commands and promise, he fell down. He worshipped him. And you see a, a change in Abram. As when God revealed himself fully, his omnipotence, his, his power, El Shaddai, God Almighty, the, the correct response was that he bowed down in worship. He saw that God was able to do the impossible. And so, again, if you haven't read Ab Abraham's story, you see he had ups, he had downs, he had a, a growing faith. And I love this about God. This shows that perfect grace of God. Abraham wasn't perfect when God uh, called him. He made many mistakes. You can see it throughout, throughout his life that he, he, he made 
wrong decisions, wrong choices. But God did not forsake him. God did not leave him. God is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy. He was there with him through him, through those times so that Abraham could fulfill um, the lineage and promises that God originally promised him. And we find it in our own life as well, that faith grows like a muscle. You know, when you go to the gym or work in the garden or something like that, you put stress on your muscles and it grows in, in strength and power, but also it grows in the endurance as well. So you're not, only, you're not only able to lift heavier weights, but also you're able to lift um, them more often or, or more regularly or more repetitions. So, and we find that with our faith as well, that when God puts us into a situation and it tests our faith and we make a choice, where am I going to go? Am I going to listen to God? Am I going to trust God? Am I going to uh, hold on to him through this experience? And you do then you find that you can trust God more further because he is with you through that time. He has blessed you. You, you. you see his protection. You see his care. And you say, when you go through another time, maybe it's a bit different this time. Maybe it's a bit worse. You find, ah, God kept me in the past. He's going to keep me in the future as well. And so your faith grows as you, as you trust him more. But as I've been praying through this week and praying with others, I've had a question both for myself and, you know, that I'm, I pray will, will help you as well through these times. But how do we grow our faith during these uncertain times? This uncertainty of, of, of especially not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing. And I'm so thankful for Heather and uh, what she said. Yes, we do know eventually what is going to happen and the promises that we do have. But there's this time in between then. And it brings uncertainty especially during our time. So how do we grow our faith during these uncertain times? And the first one is simple, but I believe very powerful is look up. Last year, I remember there was a number of ads um, from our government, all in bus stations and, and, and train stations and all these different things saying, look up, look up. And I love that because it wasn't just the physical act of looking up or, or experiencing the sunshine. For me as a Christian, look up means look to God. Look to God, especially through these times, to find strength. It doesn't mean ignore your problems. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, pretend that everything's okay. But it means instead of spending so much time uh, looking and focusing, I guess, on the things that are happening to us that we don't like, instead, look up to God, find strength and encouragement in him. And as we talked about, as I shared that very first verse, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Paul said this when he was in prison. Paul said this in that dingy, dungy, wet, um, chained uh, prison. That he found strength. He found joy in the Lord through this. Because he knew that the Lord is near. And he is near here as well. One of my favorite verses in uh, Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3, it says, Though the fig tree uh, does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive tree fails and the field produces no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Sounds like a hopeless situation at that time that Habakkuk was, was facing and the Israelites were facing at that time. All these things were going wrong. They had nothing. Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. And the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. I love that. All these things he could have focused on. Habakkuk could have said, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. In these uncertain times, let's do this. And as Colossians says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We can focus all about what's happening on us, what's happening to us in this world. But as uh, Paul writes to the Colossians, um, 
let's lift up our heads. Let's set our eyes on things above rather than on things below. Secondly, I, I want to encourage you to look out. To, again, not just look at what's happening in your life, but to see the needs of others, to see uh, people that, you know, are going through this the same as you and to help them through this journey as well. And, you know, I, I've had a struggle this week as I've made uh, many, many phone calls. And, you know, there's been times where I've said, I just don't want to. I'm tired. Even, you know, what, what can you do really at home? But I, as I was talking again through people this week, there is this, I don't know, I don't want to call it a lethargy or lethargy, but there, there is this tiredness that, that seems to affect us. I, I don't know why, but it's, it's what's happening to me and it's what's happening to others as well. And sometimes you don't feel like doing something. But again, when God convicts you and says, you need to call this person, I put them on your heart, call them. And when I do, friends, I'm thankful that God uh, has prompted me to make that phone call because there's a, a blessing in sharing together. There's a blessing in not just that, but, but sharing hope and, and, and sharing experiences and sharing in prayer as well because it doesn't just lift up that, that person, it lifts up you as well. And so I encourage you, look out. Don't just look up and do nothing but look out to the needs of others. And as Philippians says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And finally, I want to encourage you, lift up. Lift up. What is something that you can do to be a blessing to others? Uh, yes, a phone call. Yes, praying for them. Yes, but what else? What else practically can we do? Uh, still in lockdown, so that we're, we have many restrictions, but there are things that we can do. And it's so essential through this time to follow the, the teachings of Paul in Galatians, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. This is what God wants us to do. And by focus, for first, looking up, then looking out, and then lifting up. I have experienced um, over the last couple of weeks the blessing it is. As Jesus says, it's better to give than receive. And when we do this, it, it lifts us up through this time. It helps us through these times of uncertainty. It grows our faith through this time. And the question is, what can you do? What can you do? As I've said many times, we believe that Jesus Christ is coming very, very soon. This is the, the essence of, of many of my conversations, many of my phone calls. Oh, we see it. We see it. We see it. What can we do to encourage someone? What can we do to share the truth with, one, with someone? What can we do to to buoy up and, and grow our own faith through this time. So I want to challenge you. Is there something that the Lord is laying on your heart now for you to apply throughout this week, for you to live throughout this week differently than last week, differently than this week? What is something that you can apply in your life from the word of God? Maybe you want to spend more time in the word of God. and Read the promises that will feed your soul. Maybe you need to spend more time in prayer to, to see and, and to ask for that help that comes from God. Maybe you need to make your faith practical in doing something that can be a blessing to somebody else. Whatever it is, I pray that as Abraham was, no matter the uncertainty of it, by faith go and be obedient as God, uh, for God, and you will be blessed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh, I just want to thank you and praise you that you are this fantastic, wonderful God. And even during these uncertain times, we can have joy. We can rejoice through these times. We know we're not perfect. You, you, we confess that to you. But thank God that you use us 
that you're not done with us yet and you're continuing to grow us. And so, Father, help us to be people of faith this week. People of faith, not just in word, but in action as well. And again, you can be seen in us. Bless us through this time. For those of us who are really struggling, I pray that you would surround them. You would surround them. You would uplift them through this time. And you would help us to look up. You would help us to look out. You would help us to lift up for the needs of others. For that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.